All right, how are you? Yeah, good. It's good to be with you. You know, if you've been around First Christian for very long, you know that we love to help ordinary people discover that God created them to be extraordinary neighbors. It's why we're excited about this series. It's why I believe that over the course of these four weeks, many of our understanding of and relationship with God will go to a whole new place because we're learning to value the one thing that Jesus values more than anything else, and that is people. We want to value people. And so we've begun each week with Jesus' words from Mark chapter 12. I'm going to read them, but this time, if you feel comfortable, I want you to read them out loud with me. We're going to show them on the screen for you. Jesus' words from Mark chapter 12. Here's what he said. Read with me. Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. I love that. Do me a favor, turn to your neighbor and say, love your neighbor. All right? All right, good. Now, you got that pretty well. Now, turn to your neighbor now and say, nothing is greater. Nothing is greater. All right. That's right. Jesus' words, he says, listen, love your neighbor as you run after me with all that you are, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Nothing is greater than these. How many of you believe that loving your neighbor is important to Jesus? Okay? Good. Most of you. All right. This is truth. Hey, that's okay. Okay. We're batting over 500. This truth uh, came home to many pastors in the Denver area about 10 years ago when they were beginning to meet to say, how can we have a measurable impact on our city? So they invited the mayor to join them, and they asked him one simple question. They said, how can we as churches best work together to serve our city? Now, no one was really prepared for how he would respond. He said, you know what, the majority of issues in our community today that we are facing, whether it be at-risk kids, areas with dilapidated housing, uh, shut-ins, elderly people who have no one to care for them, whether it be drug and alcohol abuse or loneliness or child hunger, most issues facing our city today that we're up against would be drastically reduced or eliminated if we could just figure out a way to become a community of great neighbors. You love that? Most of us, if we recognize challenges facing our community, would do what everyone else does. We go down to local officials and we expect them to begin community programs or to pass legislation in order to uh, address the issues at hand. Many of us would move as far away from problems so that we don't have to deal with them. Some of us would actually just bury our heads, stay where we are, but hope that one day those problems go away. But the mayor said, you know what? You want to know how to change a city. You know want, to, want to know how to drastically influence the issues facing your neighborhood or your neighborhood is facing. He says, what would happen if Christians, you and your people to these pastors, what would happen if your churches and everyone in them would just learn how to obey the second part of Jesus' great commandment? What would happen if you and I learned how to simply love our neighbors? Historically speaking, where the church loves the people around, men and women, young people, in ordinary ways, those places in the world are radically changed. One of the great stories about the early church is documented by an author named Rodney Stark and his book, The Rise of Christianity. And he talks about how the early church in the first 300 years grew by an average of 40% every year. And it grew in large part because those men and women who had been captured by the heart of Jesus went out into their city streets and their villages and just began to love their neighbors in the name of Jesus. Rodney Stark writes, he says, to cities filled with homelessness and the impoverished Christianity offered charity as well as hope. To cities filled with newcomers and strangers, Christianity offered an immediate basis for attachments. That the cities filled with orphans and 
widows, Christianity provided a new and expanded sense of family. To cities torn by violent ethnic strife, Christianity offered a new basis for social solidarity. What he's really saying there is he's saying, no matter who you are, where you came from, what your skin color was, what your background is, what your socioeconomic status happens to be, he said, everyone can belong as you are. That was what made the early Christians so radically different than the world around them. Then he goes on. He says, into cities faced with epidemics, fires, and earthquakes, Christianity offered effective nursing services, meaning they didn't just accept you, they cared for you. And this was radically different than anything the world before had ever seen. The Christians subverted and transformed the Roman Empire, not by manipulation, notice this, not by rebellion, not by force, Listen, even check this out. The early Christians did not transform the Roman Empire at the, at the voting booth. Okay? And I'm not saying you shouldn't vote. I'm just saying, historically speaking, followers of Jesus have never transformed the world through politics. We should hope the politics are good for our country. We should hope politicians work for the best in our country. But our hope should remain firmly attached to Jesus and what through our lives he can do for the good of our neighbors as he works through us. And so Stark says, hey, listen, the way the early Christians transformed their world was not through force manipulation or through pushing back against them. The way they transformed the world was by loving them. It was a radical new thing that no one had ever seen before. You know, for the Romans, this drove them crazy. Julian, who was an emperor in the 4th century, began to notice that the Christians loved Romans better than Romans loved Romans. And so he began to enact new programs. One, he began to feed those who were hungry and in need of a meal. He began to build hostels for poor travelers who were passing through their territory. And he commanded his officials to care for their neighbors like the Christians were doing. But As you can imagine, their efforts failed miserably because you cannot manipulate the human heart to love someone you don't love. Meanwhile, the Christians continued to take the message of Jesus like a storm throughout the ancient world as they lived out their love for Jesus in the most ordinary and practical of ways. I love it. There's nothing more provocative than when followers of Jesus live out the Spirit of Jesus in the places where they live, work, and play. And so you say, well, what does it mean to love our neighbors? How do we actually do that? I want to take you to a place in one of the Gospels, Matthew. And the Gospels are just historical biographies of the life of Jesus. And he tells us about an encounter that Jesus had with a young boy who demonstrates for us what it means to love our neighbors. And Through this ordinary boy's life, Jesus did extraordinary things. And so if you have your Bible, you can open up to Matthew chapter 14. We'll show the text on the screen as well. But I'll set it up for you. Jesus has been with a large crowd for the majority of the day. Night is coming, and it becomes obvious that no one in the crowd had prepared for the evening meal. And so Jesus, with his followers, begins to instruct them on what to do. Pick up with me in verse 15. That evening, the disciples came to Jesus and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. You feed them. Now, I can imagine a little bit of what the disciples must have felt in that moment because there have been a handful of times in our raising kids for over the last 17 years, you know, we got five kids, that I've walked through the door and Beth has looked me in the eyes and said, you feed them. You know, it's one of those days. <laughs> You've been there? Um, most of the time when I walk through the doors, you know, it's just like there's joy in the home and it's lollipops and unicorns, okay? One of those days. We got a little five-year-old. That's just her world. But every now and then you walk through the door and it's just fortunate on that given day that every child is accounted for, okay? And so she looks me in the eyes and kind of either figuratively or literally kind of directs me to the kids and She has said, you feed them. And dads, I'll just speak to your heart for a minute. What do you think of the first time that your wife says, you feed them? What's the first thought that comes to mind? All right, that's right. We're going out to eat, okay? That's right. Because the ask well exceeds our resources in that moment, doesn't it? Right? 
Jesus looks these followers in the eyes and he, and he looks out in a crowd that numbered thousands and he says, you, feed them. you figure it out. And I love that it's an audacious request. And here's the point. When you begin to love your neighbors, there will be times that Jesus' request and the circumstances he places you in far exceed your resources. There will be moments when the way he asks you to love your neighbors will far exceed your ability to do so. Isn't that true? Isn't it true when it comes to loving our neighbors, so far often we fall short or our abilities are lacking compared to the need? So over the course of these weeks, we've been encouraging you to develop the habit of praying for one person every day. So we say, God, would you give us one person to show your love to, right? But if you're anything like me, at times I can go 24 hours without even considering that prayer. And so we have the best intention of praying for others, but sometimes we simply don't do it. How many of us know, you know what, God, I want to be able to connect with my neighbors and in the way that you lead me to, but I just haven't figured out a way to do that. How many of us have come up against opportunities where we have an opportunity to to care for someone around us, but the need greatly Uh, overwhelms our ability, our resources. How many of us know that as neighbors, uh, we know that Jesus is leading us to act selflessly and kindly, but if you're anything like me, sometimes I move through my days more selfishly than not. There are times when the need around us just surpasses our ability to resource that need, or there are times when our best efforts simply fall short, and that is true. And it's in those moments that we need to remember and keep our eyes on what happens next. Look back at the story. Just when the disciples are feeling overwhelmed, Andrew, one of the disciples, gets an idea. And I love this. It's just a ridiculous idea. Somehow he has found a young boy in the crowd whose mama thought in advance far enough to pack him a few sardines and a few triscuits, okay? And he finds him and he thinks, maybe this will help. And he has the audacity to bring the boy to Jesus. Jesus says, you feed him? He says, I don't know. Here's a boy with a lunch bag. Will this help? I love it. Philip, another one of the disciples, says, Jesus, I've been doing a little calculation. In order to feed a crowd this size, we'd have to work for a year in order to resource it. So the disciples are coming up with all of these ridiculous ideas, but Andrew's the one who kind of takes center stage. And he redirects this boy in front of Jesus. And I want you to notice what Jesus does not do. Okay, disciples with all their ridiculous ideas, all of their resources fall short, and Jesus doesn't look at Andrew and say, Andrew, what are you thinking? How could you come up with such a dumb idea? He doesn't say that. He doesn't look at the boy and come sort of patronizingly pat him on the head and say, thank you for offering your lunch, but no thank you. It's not sufficient. He doesn't say that. Instead, Jesus takes this little guy's lunch and he directs his disciples to begin to set the meal for the crowds. Look at verse 18. He says, then bring it to me. He told the people to sit down on the grass and Jesus took the five loaves and two fish and he looked up toward heaven. I mean, he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it it to the people. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. Matthew writes, about 5,000 men were fed that day in addition to all the women and children. Now, I want you to imagine with me what it must have been like as the disciples are making their way through the crowd. And every time they reach into their basket to pass out handfuls of bread and fish, they expect that that handful will be their last, right? But every time they look back into the basket, there's more to distribute. And in those moments, they discovered a life-altering, faith-stretching lesson, and it's a lesson you and I must discover if we're going to love our neighbors well. And here it is. Small sacrifices can lead to a miracle. Remember that. Write that down. Small sacrifices can lead to a miracle. Small steps of obedience can invite God into your life to do the extraordinary. 
small steps can lead to a miracle. You know, I would have loved to have been there that day to watch the disciples feed the masses. I would have loved to have been there that day to watch Jesus multiply the resources. But even more than that, I would love to have this boy's life kind of blowing, kind of mind blowing, faith stretching faith. Kind of trust in Jesus such that I'm willing to bring to him whatever little I have, believing he can take my ordinary and do the extraordinary. And don't you want the same? Do you want the kind of faith that breaks you out of the mundane and out of an adventureless way of living to where we move past this weekend of what some of us can slip into as sort of a religious expression or form where we show up on the weekends and we sing some songs and listen to a halfway decent message and then we try to get out of here without saying hello to anyone, okay? And then we repeat it again and again and And all of our hope is wrapped up in this weekend to hopefully get some inspiration for the week ahead. Listen, no one really wants that. In fact, for most people, there's far too much going on in the weekend for us to give up precious hours to give our lives to an empty form of religion. No, what you and I want is to believe God so deeply, so widely, that we, we think for a moment that maybe, just maybe, if we offered our ordinary lives to Him, He could do a similar sort of extraordinary miracle through our lives as He did through this young boy. And I believe that's God's dream for your life. But in order to become an extraordinary neighbor, God's going to have to take you into new places of faith where you begin to trust Him. He's going to have to expand your courage to where when he says go, you say yes, I will. When he says love, you say where. When he says serve, you say who. And he begins to take you on an adventure of loving your neighbor where he does more through your life than ever before. You say, well, man, that's what I want. I want to be a part of a relationship with King Jesus like that. What does it look like? Well, I'm going to get there in a moment, but let me just give you a bit of a recap with where we've been over these last couple of weeks because it's so important where where we're going to go in these next couple of moments. You know, two weeks ago, we said that the first step to becoming an extraordinary neighbor is that you, you and I've got to learn to pray. And we've actually got to become praying neighbors and begin praying for the people around us. And we said, if you want to become an extraordinary neighbor, develop the habit of praying one prayer every day. And the prayer goes like this, God, would you give me one person to show your love to today. God, give me one person to show your love to today. Now, without a show of hands, how many of us just think for a moment are praying that prayer on at least a semi-consistent level every day? No show of hands, but how many of us are praying that prayer? If so, I want to encourage you to keep going. But if not, I believe this is the first step that you've got to take to becoming an extraordinary neighbor. God, would you give me one person to show your love to every day. Because here's what's going to happen. When you begin to ask God for opportunities to love, he's going to provide those opportunities. But hear me, more times than not, those opportunities will exceed your resources. Those opportunities will exceed your time margin. Those opportunities will exceed your strength, will exceed your know-how. And in those places, you're going to have to remember the lesson that this young boy learned is that when you give what you have, Jesus will give you more to give. Okay? That's what he learned. He said, I'll bring what I have, trusting that you'll give me more to give. You want to be an extraordinary neighbor? You begin by praying. God will give me opportunities to love my neighbors. But when you pray that, the opportunities will exceed your resources And you must remember in those places, Jesus, as I give, you will give me more to give. And then as you do that, you got to go to the next step. And so today what I want to do is give you just very practically something that you week in and week out can begin to practice 
in order to become an extraordinary neighbor. And so if you're taking notes, I'm just going to give you three ways that you can do this. I believe if we're going to be extraordinary neighbors, ordinary people trusting God to do extraordinary things, you and I must develop the habit of blessing people. Develop the habit of blessing. You say, well, what in the world does it mean to bless someone, right? The word bless means to, really at the root of its word and meaning, it means to confer happiness on someone else. Or it means to confer prosperity in their lives. Or it means to add strength to another person's arm. So to bless someone means that I'm going to build someone up or encourage them so they will increase in strength and prosperity. Or it means I'm going to find ways to do something that relieves a burden in someone else's life that helps them breathe more easily. And so if I'm going to become a great neighbor who lives with the Spirit of Jesus to those around me, I've got to learn what it means to bless others. Now, let me give you three ways to do that very simply. Number one, if you want to live as a blessing in other people's lives, number one, begin to speak words of encouragement. Words of encouragement. I've heard it said that words of encouragement are like oxygen to the soul. And how many of you know that that's true? Right? How many of you have people in your lives who at the appropriate time have spoken words of life to you? And how many of you know in those moments that it's been the thing that's gotten you back up on your feet, that's added strength to your life when you were weak, that's relieved a burden, that's giving you hope? I love Mark Twain. He said, you know what? I can survive for two months on a single word of encouragement or on a good compliment. And isn't that true? Encouragement just has a way of bringing life to the soul. And so I want to encourage you this week to find a way to bless someone else by verbally speaking or writing or texting a note of encouragement. And as you do, you're going to bring them life. Beth and I have a basket in our home that came from a particular season where people had spoken words of encouragement into our life. For many of them, they're some of the most significant people in our lives. Many of them we don't even know. But we can go back to that basket when we choose because there, it's in those places that we're reminded of someone who thought we were valuable at a particular season. Someone who thought we mattered. Someone who drew something out of us we didn't even see or know that was there. And in the same way, whether it's a colleague at work tomorrow whether it's a family member, whether it's someone living in your home, whether it's a neighbor next door, your words of encouragement have the opportunity to bring someone life. So be a blessing through your words. Number two, be a blessing through your actions, through actions of kindness. I think one of the most profound ways to be a blessing toward others is to find opportunities to serve those around you. So tomorrow... As you go to work, bless a colleague by just offering to take them out to lunch and just listen and get to know their story and find opportunities to encourage. Listen, you can watch someone's kid. You got a young family around you, a young, young set of parents who need to get out of the house and just need some time away. Offer to watch their kids. Now, here's the deal. Make sure you know their kids before you offer to watch them, okay? Otherwise, you become that crazy neighbor we've been talking about, okay? Don't do that. You can watch their kids. Listen, you got an elderly um, lady or, or gentleman in your neighborhood, offer to help them clean up their yard at the end of this season. Come alongside them through a, a repeated or weekly behavior they have or habit they have where you can encourage them and, and build them up. Help a neighbor move, okay? Find ways in your life to exhibit kindness toward those around you. Now, the reason we express kindness is because the heart of Jesus is kind. In fact, I love the words of the Apostle Paul in Colossians 3. Listen to these when he says, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves. Now, he's going to go on and I'll read it for you in a moment. But I just want you to feel the weight of this. He says, Since God chose to lay his love over your life. Since God chose to call you his sons and daughters. Since God chose to pursue you before you ever pursued Him. Since God in Christ gave you His best when we were at our worst. He says, since God chose 
for you to become the holy people that he loves. Now listen to his words. You must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You love that? He says, since God poured out his kindness to you, clothe yourself in kindness toward others. And let me tell you, there's nothing more provocative in our world that bleeds with unkindness than a man or woman or young person or a community of people who clothe themselves in kindness and in the spirit of Jesus toward them. Okay? Finally, number three, as you speak words of encouragement, you offer acts of kindness. Number three, give gifts. Give gifts. Look for opportunities to bless someone by meeting a need. Maybe they know who you are. Maybe you give the gift anonymously, and oftentimes that's the better way. I think there are a few better ways to convey the spirit of love than through gift giving. And listen, sometimes gift giving costs you something financially. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it costs monetarily, but sometimes it costs with your time. Sometimes it costs with your energy. Sometimes it costs with your ingenuity and your creativity and a particular skill that God's given you. Sometimes it costs by you finding a resource that you have, like the young boy in Jesus' story, and you just offer it, trusting God to do something through it. But you offer your gifts to others. I can tell you that when God's given opportunity for Beth and I to give gifts to others, this is one of these ways where we get to bless people that we often shy away from. Maybe you've been there. When God provides an opportunity to give a gift, specifically a financial gift or a gift of time or something that's going to cost me, I can come up with a hundred reasons in that moment not to give it, right? But when you think, man, here's three reasons why not to give. I can't financially afford it. I don't have the margin in my life. I have my own responsibilities and financial goals. In those moments, remember the story of Jesus and the lesson that the boy learned. When you give what you have, Jesus will give you more to give. I can't tell you how many times Beth and I have taken a step of faith and said, we don't have what it takes to give in this moment, but we see a need, and God, by your mercy, we're going to help meet that need. And would you take our ordinary gift that's small, and would you make it extraordinary in that person's life? And God not only meets their need, but he has a way of replenishing what we give and bringing life to us, encouragement to us, joy to us. And I believe he wants to do the same in your life. Give what you have and trust him to give you more to give. I believe that as you do this, God's going to do some extraordinary things through your life. I believe as you show up tomorrow morning in your office to be a blessing, and listen, don't walk through the office doors and say, I am here to be a blessing, okay? Don't do that. You'll get fired and probably deserve it, okay? Don't do that. Okay, just, just under the radar, be a blessing. As you show up in your neighborhood to be a blessing, as you show up in your family, your dysfunctional, busted up families, we come on the holidays, as you show up in your friend circle, as you show up just tomorrow and you walk through your ordinary day and you say, God, give me opportunities to show your love to those around me. I want to be a blessing to them. God's going to do extraordinary things through your life because it's the way historically he's always done it. Listen, we live in a city that is crying out for ordinary people to offer their lives so that God can do extraordinary things for their good. Today as we gather, we live in a city that is not at all interested in the fact that there's a little church building out on Highway 92. They don't care. We live in a city that it's not provocative for us to gather on Sunday mornings and then in small groups throughout the week. That's not provocative at all any longer. The world is not interested in a group of people who get together on the weekends and in word love King Jesus. What they want to know is whether or not in deed and in action we will love and serve them in the name of King Jesus. And when we do, lives and cities are transformed. I was in Denver just a couple of weeks ago and with a number of church leaders there, we were touring Compassion International's facility. And if you know anything about Compassion, they are a nonprofit around the world that today is sponsoring 1.8 million children, providing care and medical needs and education and food and 
um, just walking alongside of these kids. They've also partnered with 6,700 local churches and planted churches to help provide for their kids that they're supporting. Now, when we were there at Compassion, we had the opportunity to meet with the leaders who oversee all of their work in Africa and all of their work in Asia. And the, the worker over um, all of their work in Africa shared with us that in their 6,700 churches around 12 countries around the world, every one of their churches is experiencing dynamic growth today. Every one of those 6,700 churches. Now, if you know anything about church planting or church growth, you know it's a profound statistic for every church to be growing, right? You know today the reality is that more churches are dying than they are growing, right? More communities of faith are plateauing than they are vibrant. And yet he said what's happening in our churches is that they're all experiencing an accelerated growth. And you'd say, well, why is that? What's different about those churches than ours? What is it? He said, here's the difference. When the church begins to love, not only in word, but in deed, all of a sudden the world notices. You love that? When the church begins, when Christians, when ordinary people begin to love, not only Jesus in word, Jesus we love you, but Jesus in deed, and therefore we're going to love our neighbors because we love you, all of a sudden our cities notice. Our villages notice. Your town notices. Your neighbors notice. You know why? Because our world no longer cares if you love Jesus in word. It's not attractive for you and I to say we're Christians. No one is drawn to that. What they want to know is whether you live with the spirit of King Jesus. Whether you'll demonstrate extraordinary acts of kindness, encouragement, and generosity. Because you love them as much as Jesus does. And so listen, here's my prayer for you. My prayer in the days ahead is that you would offer your ordinary lives to Jesus and you would bring what you have, trusting him to do extraordinary things through you. And if you will do that, I believe that God can change your little part of the world. So that's what I want to pray for you if you'll bow your head with me and we just want to close celebrating that truth. Jesus, we thank you that you loved us before we loved you. We thank you that as the Apostle Paul said, you called us to be one of your own. We want to thank you that you invite us into a relationship with you and you send us out in your name filled with your Spirit to be your hands and feet in the places where we live and work and play. And so today, God, I pray that by your Spirit, you would embolden us, you would give us creativity, you would give us clarity of where to love our neighbors by being a blessing to them. And as we do, may we celebrate the extraordinary ways that you work through our ordinary lives. For the good of others and for your glory, Jesus. We pray these things. Amen. Amen.